Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC card, the uh, Fight Night card from the Apex from this weekend, for this weekend. And usually what we're able to do is three separate videos. We will usually be able to do one video, which is the first DFS video, which is where we go over the best plays. Um, and then we do a betting breakdown, usually on Friday, which is more contrarian, where we have some fun, basically trying to figure out who everybody's picking and go against them. And then on the third video is usually when it's on Saturday is when we go ahead and just build lineups using the various SIM tools that we have with the explicit goal of trying to win that 150 max big lottery tournament. And we were very successful last time we were, uh, we were broadcasting before UFC 300. We got, I think, tied for second and cast for 23,000 using the process that we illustrated right there on the stream. Unfortunately, this week, I am, I'm kind of swamped um, with different obligations. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to get all three videos out. But we're going to try. Um, we're going to start at least. So we're going to start by doing the kind of the best plays videos where we go over you know, who the best DFS plays are for, for Saturday with the idea, again, that that's not necessarily who we're going to end up playing because – you know, it, we're, we're trying to win the big 150 max, so it's not just picking the best best plays. We have to figure out where we're going to get leverage, who's going to be low-owned, and things like that. Uh, it's also early. It's Wednesday. But, again, as I am uh, going to be pretty busy the next couple of days, this is the best I'm going to do is at least get this video out, video out to you uh, now. Uh, better than nothing. And I think I have an idea of what's going on. First of all, the it's it's bad enough that well after one week off you have a fight card which is doesn't have quite a you know a lot of name value and doesn't have a lot of doesn't lot of, doesn't have a lot of juice to it uh, in a lot of ways um but what's even worse is that in the last couple of days there was a fighter who pulled out and because of the replacement fighter you're going to start off the card or start off the DFS analysis with basically a free squint, um, which makes things even harder when it comes to winning, you know, the, the, the big cheese. You know, we we have one, two, three, four. We do have 13 fights, but one of them, again, is kind of a free square, which we'll talk about. So it is going to make it more difficult to, you know, get the optimal lineup or win that big 150 max by yourself. So we will we will see. But let, let's talk about that one first. So you have Jay, uh, what's his name? Um, James Lontop, who was originally supposed to fight Gabe Green, and it was going to be an almost pick him fight. And such the price, he was priced at 8200 Green backed out or dropped out, whatever, uh, couldn't fight. So he was replaced by Chris Padilla. And Padilla is, is significantly worse. And if you look at the odds, you have Lontop as a minus 400 favorite. So essentially, if he were being priced accurately on DraftKings, he would be probably 9,600. But because again, you have to lock these, you have to lock these salaries in once they put them out. You have to keep them at 8,200. So you're getting essentially a free square. Now again, nothing's free because MMA is, you know, it's it's nothing is guaranteed, and it's not like he's minus 99 to one. He's only a minus 400 favorite. But the fact is, is that it is kind of a theoretical lock, you know, because being priced as if he were about to pick him. And he wins the fight about 85, you know, 80% of the time. So this is going to be the the main play that most people play. Now, again, we could talk about maybe on another, you know, another day. Um, is it worth fading him? Because, again, he's going to be so high owned. I mean, he's going to have to be high owned. And that's, again, more for the how to build your lineups uh, type of thing. Now, the other thing you'll notice that there's no real prop yet out on him. But, I mean, what type of prop is going to change the fact that he's kind of a theoretical lock? I, mean, very, very, I can't imagine him not being a theoretical lock. The, the, the thing that I guess is interesting is the Padilla side, because Padilla, he was priced, again, they could have priced him however they wanted um, once they saw the odds, and, I, and they didn't even give, do him any favors either. either. I mean, they made him 6900 and given he's a four to one underdog, they could have given him a little bit cheaper price and, uh, you know, made it, you know, created kind of an interesting leverage spot, which, I mean, he still is. I mean, he's going to win the fight about 20% of the time, 15% of the time. 
And when he does, he's going to be taking the lineups away from about, you know, at least 60% of the pool. So you, you do have some real leverage already with Padilla, but it would have been nice if they, if they priced him a little lower. And also it doesn't matter what his inside the distance line is. I mean, he's going to be a good leverage play regardless, simply because, I mean, he's priced, you know, fair enough, I guess, maybe a little underpriced, uh, overpriced in 6,900. But because Lontop is such, you know, to the garner so much ownership, that Padilla, you're going to have to play him in your GPPs, uh, in your big, you know, in your big uh, 150 managers. But we'll, we'll, I mean, if we get to be able to do that video, we'll talk more about that. But, you know, make sure that if you play more than, I guess, 10 lineups, then you at least have one, I believe, with Padilla, and I think it's worth the leverage. But as far as just the pure play, I mean, Lontop is clearly the best play on the board. All right, uh, Mahashate versus Benitez. So Mahashate, 8,800, Benitez, 7,400. So what we're looking for here is is an inside the distance line for Mahashate of about, you know, I don't know, minus, minus 110 would be nice, but even like plus 120 would be okay. Because the issue is, is that if he's going to win, it's he's basically a pure striker. So in the absence of grappling upside and takedown upside, you, you're going to need to get that KO for him to get there, you know, or at least multiple knockdowns. So he really is, whether he's a good player or not, kind of a prisoner of his, of his inside distance line. And we look at it, let's see. That's pretty good. So Mashai inside the distance is minus 120. So he's, he's definitely viable. Once again, the only problem here is that even though he's inside the distance line is minus 120, you know, some of that is based on his, you know, round two or round three finishing upside. What you're really interested in is his round one upside. And it says here he's about plus 250. That's actually not bad. Okay, so you're, you're saying about, what, 30% of the time or so he wins in the first round? I guess that's fair enough. So so he looks like a pretty strong play. Uh, Benitez on the other side at 7,400. I mean, we're looking for either just a whole bunch of takedowns, um, which I guess is possible. Um, or an inside the distance line for him about plus, I don't know, I'll give you even plus 300. Let's see. If you can give me plus 300 on him inside the distance as his implied odds, I think that's going to be good enough. Let's see. Eh, plus 375, so not quite. So it looks as though Mahashate is going to be the play here, uh, if anybody, um, probably going to be fading for the intent. All right, next fight, we have Ivana Petrovich versus Nia Lang. And we have the, another really, really big favorite here. Petrovich is minus, you know, 400 or so, maybe even more. So her price is, I mean, it's actually pretty reasonable given those given those win odds for openers at 9,400. But for her to be a good price, you need more than just those win odds. You need to have an inside distance line here, which is worth playing. So... I think Petrovic inside the distance should be at least minus 130 for her to be playable. And we'd like, we'd like it to be more. Let's take a look. Petrovic inside the distance is extremely strong. It's like minus 260. So she is definitely a smash play. And she also in round one at plus 200 is a very strong play as well. So um, I actually like it a little better than plus 200 in, you know, in round one, but I still think this is fine. Uh, so Petrovic on these metrics is going to be a very, very strong play. Good favorite to try to get in. And Liang Na, I mean, what's what's interesting about her is that if, in fact, she does win, I mean, she's going to be going for takedowns. She's got all kinds of volume, all kinds of, you know, aggression. So her wins are always going to score one. So if everybody sees what I see, that Petrovic is going to be a pretty, you know, obviously have these metrics to be a strong play then you can play Lian Nya, both because her metrics are actually pretty good, given her price. Like her inside the distance is going to be what? Plus, what's it say? It says plus 650. That really doesn't make too much sense. Um, just because I, mean, I don't see almost any variation where she wins without finishing. So uh, I think that she's going to be a good leverage play, good, good overall play, as a punt play, whatever you want to call her. So I think both sides of this fight um, should be considered. 
All right, uh, Caitlin Souza versus uh, uh, Manic uh, Manic Man. Souza's ninety two hundred. So again, for her to be viable, you need to have her maybe about a minus one ten, at least, right? Uh, favorite to finish inside the distance. And let's see, inside the distance plus two hundred, and that's just really bad. And if anybody has the takedown upside, it's going to be Man. So um, Souza's not a good play at all. She's, to me, almost a clear fade here. I guess the only side of this I would even consider is Marnik Mann because, I mean, if she does win, it's probably because she got takedowns, I guess. But the issue here is that you're getting no leverage against Sousa at all because I don't imagine anybody's going to play her given those inside the distance lines. So, I think man, listen, she's going to show up in, in 150 max and things like that. But as far as who the core plays are, um, I think this whole, I think this whole fight is very grim. So moving along, we have Dante Mays versus Kai Machado. Uh, Machado minus 120, Mays minus 10, you know, about a, about a pick them, and the prices seem somewhat reasonable. Let's take a look at the inside the distance lines here. I mean, you don't really need too much of an inside the distance line to be good at these prices. That's the thing with these heavyweights. I imagine that you're going to get an okay inside the distance line. But let's take a look. Um, Machado inside plus 175. Oh, excuse me. Inside is plus 270. Oof. I mean, I was expecting a little better. So I don't know. It seems, it seems pretty thin. And Maze inside the distance plus 270. That seems kind of thin, also. I mean, at least Maze, you could argue, has you know some takedown upside. Boy, it's it's tough usually to fade these 8200 8K or whatever heavyweight fights. But the metrics here are so poor. I think that's kind of what I, I think that's what I want to recommend here. Um it just really rates to be just kind of a sloppy heavyweight fight with no volume that nobody really scores all that well. So that, that that's what I would do. I'd probably end up fading both sides of this. All right, Mike Figlak versus Austin Hubbard. Uh, again, we got to respect this pricing here. So 8,400 versus 7,800. Neither fighter, should I say neither fighter with takedowns? I mean, I guess you could argue Hubbard is more experienced, so he might be more inclined to go for takedowns here, but it's not that likely. So we really are relying on the inside the distance line. So let's just take a look at it. Oh my God. Figlak inside plus 285. Yuck. Hubbard inside plus 375. Yuck. Another kind of dangerous fight to fade. And the only reason I say that is just because of the, of the pricing. You know, if you fade too many of these mid range fights, then you're really going to have to get those, you know, get those big underdogs to come home. But, Right now, it looks like, you know, the metrics on both of these mid-range fights are really poor. Victor Henry versus Ronnie Yaya. Here's another big price fight. You have uh, Victor Henry, again, almost minus four, 500. And we'll look at the price. And I think he's priced fairly, given his price tag, uh, given his win odds. But for him to be a good DFS play, it's not just the win odds. He's going to need a 9,500, extreme, an extremely strong inside the distance line. And we'll take a look at it. Um, Henry inside, plus 145. That's extremely poor. I, I don't I don't get that at all. I, I First of all, this is just one bookie that has this at plus 145. I'm, I'm expecting this to be lower. So to take a look at that by the time the um, – the, the, all the props come out really. This seems really low for a 9,500 favorite of, of male fighters, you know. And Henry can bring volume; he can knock the dude out. So, I, I, I'm just not a believer in this in this in this line. But given the fact this is the line, I guess Henry's got to be considered kind of a fade. You know, um, it, it, Henry. One thing that Henry does have going for him, by the way, he can put up a lot of volume. So even if he doesn't get the win by inside the distance. He could pump a whole bunch of volume up, but at 9,500, you just can't win on volume alone. Um, not at that price. Yaya, on the other hand, let's take a look at him. 
Yaya inside the distance would be plus what? Plus 525, and that's really poor also. He does have takedowns, sort of. Um, as a matter of fact, I mean, he is a submission grappler. I mean, part of me wants to take a shot at this, but again, if Victor Henry is going to have just such poor metrics, he's probably not going to be that popular, so you're really not getting too much in leverage either. So, wait, but who the hell am I going to play? I don't want to play anybody here. We'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to guys that can play, that we can play. Uh, it's coming pretty soon, actually. So Tim Means versus Uros Medic. All right, this has got to be something. So Uros Medic minus 300. So I imagine he's another $9,100 fighter. Let's take a look at it. Yep, right there at 9100 So Medic, for him to be a good price, he's got to be, you know, minus 110 inside. Let's take a look. Medic inside is minus 165. All right, that's very strong. Okay. Now, I will say that uh, qualitatively, uh, I don't know if this is such a great matchup for Medic to get like a first round knockout. You know, Means is very, 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 you know, he's he's a tough dude, you know. So I don't know about this. And Medic doesn't have any grappling upside, but listen, give, given the metric, given what we're talking about, I mean, he's got he's got to look good. Okay, so we're gonna consider Medic a good play. And I have to say that Tim Means. Um, he's got two takedowns, three takedowns, two takedowns, one takedown. I mean, if he wins this fight, I mean, he's probably going to get some, some takedowns and who knows, maybe he gets a sub if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Medic in his last fight was subbed pretty, pretty quickly. Actually, as a matter of fact, a couple of fights before that, he was subbed pretty quickly. Now again, that was against Jalen Turner still, you know, so, um, boy, this is really going to be a stars and scrubs type uh slate for me i guess because i think i like both sides of this kind of like high priced fight as well all right so this is probably going to be the most popular fighter on the slate well uh let's get to this fight jonathan pierce versus david onama and we'll look at the the odds the odds are not a big deal you know there's no great money line value here he's minus 180 and the price is very very commensurate of that and even the inside the distance line. So here's where we get started. So inside the distance, he's plus 130. And I would say that even without anything else, I would say that's an extremely strong number for 8,600. But when you factor in the kicker here that he's going to be going for just takedown after takedown after takedown, you put that on top of the inside the distance line. I mean, this is, with the exception of on top, I have to imagine that Pierce is going to be the highest owned fighter on the slate. And that's for good reason. You know, is these metrics are just insane. And and if you follow you follow this to, to that point, because his metrics are insane and because it's going to be such an obvious play, like Onama is someone that you have to take a look at here. Um, if he looks even the slightest bit reasonable, you have to play him. And you look at this Onama inside the distance, plus 215. At this price, I mean, this is this is actually, I don't know if I want to get too into it in this video, but this is, Onama is probably a better play than Pierce. You know, they're both very, I mean, Pierce is insane, insanely strong of a play, but because of that, he's going to be so highly owned that if Onama is a good play at all, he's going to be a insane leverage, and he's a great play in and of himself, so Onama is really the GPP hammer. Um, I think if you play, you know, maybe if, if I never get to the construction video, with the except, forget about putting the Sims aside for a minute. Like if you're playing like a whole bunch of lineups, I think you got to be incredibly overweight on Onama uh, on this card. Okay, uh, moving on. We have Denise versus Morris. The Team Peel uh, video says Denise. Uh, against Austin Lane. D nice is 9,000 versus Austin Lane, 7,200. So at that price, we better have an inside the distance line of right minus 110. He doesn't have a lot of takedown upside to speak of. We'll take a look. Wow. Denise or D nice inside the distance minus 220. Let's go. I mean, that's exactly what you want to see. 
And even Lane, though, on the other side, him inside is about plus 300 or so. And you could argue that Austin Lane might have some takedown upside here. So I think that both sides of this fight are very playable. So, you know, for, for those of you that were worried, I was like fading like every fight on the board here. It's not like that. There, there's there's several fights here that you just really want to play both sides. And we just talked about a few of them right in a row. Um, Kareem Silva versus Kareem Silva. Yeah, Kareem Silva versus Ariane Lipsky. Um, I think that Silva, just I'm going to throw it out there, is going to be pretty popular. Um, just because we'll, we'll take a look at this. When you look at Kareem Silva, you just look at her, at her results here. Submission one, submission one, submission one, submission two, TKO one. I mean, and, and she's only 8,600. And people are definitely going to play her. I mean, I, I, but let's take a look. I mean, let's take a look at really what, what her line is. You know, remember for 8,600, you better have an inside the distance line of, well, well, pretty much this. <laughs> so Silva inside the distance plus 125, very, very strong. It's about the same as Pierce, actually. Um, which actually begs the question. I mean, who really is a better player, Pierce or Silva? It's it's got to be Pierce, just because of the incredible amount of takedown upside that he has. Silva has some takedown upside also, but in a weird way, Silva, if she even gets maybe one takedown in this fight, she might just get the submission right away. Where 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 Pierce is going to put the hammer on Obadama like for multiple takedowns. Um, so Silva. Very strong. So if that's the case, maybe Lipsky's strong too. Wow, Lipsky inside is eh, plus 300 or so. At her price, that's not particularly good. Although I would say that because, again, I think Lipsky is going to be kind of high owned. That I think the Lips, that, excuse me, that uh, Silva's going to be high owned. I do think Lipsky's in play to get some leverage. So this is. This is actually becoming a pretty interesting slate because while the on top is that theoretical lock, I mean, can you get away with, with tossing it? You know what I mean? Remember that on top does not necessarily have the greatest inside the distance line. I mean, he might, but he doesn't as far as what I'm looking at uh, is his look, even though we don't have the actual inside the distance line, you look at on top, at least the, the, the one, and a, the, you know, the round props, over two and a half rounds is is favored, so he's light. He's fights favored to probably go the distance. So the thing is, is that even though he's a huge money line value, doesn't mean he makes the optimal. Like if you get like like some of these mid range dudes to, to smash, specifically the underdogs, you know you you could get the winning lineup and you could have Lontop in there. Uh, you have, can have a long top win and not even make it. So this is very interesting, very interesting DFS card. And if that weren't enough, we're going to, we're going to get to another fight, which is also when you probably might want to play both sides. And that was Ryan Spann versus, uh, was it Boris? No, Bodan Gusko. So these are the heavyweights or light heavyweights. I forget what they are, but I know they're inside the distance lines are both going to be really strong. You have Span inside minus 155. At 88, 8,900. Remember, we, we were talking about playing Machate not too long ago at like minus 110 or plus 120 or whatever that was. But you have Ryan Spann at like minus 160. And that's strong. Not to mention, he could get some takedowns also here. And then on the other side, you have look at Gustav, he's plus 200 inside or so at his price. So, extremely strong bit of leverage there as well. So, both sides of this fight, let's go. And what's cool about this is that we get to this main event, which is a, you know, it's a five-round fight. So five-round fights are going to typically have good median projections, which means that they're going to probably get some degree of ownership. But when you look at the inside the distance line, you look at this fight, I mean, you have Nikola, who's the favorite, his inside the distance line is probably going to be plus 140 or something like that. I mean, his, let's take a look. Yeah, plus 160, big adjusted. 
and Perez inside, like plus 280 win adjusted. I mean, if anybody would be a play here, it would be Perez, I suppose. Um, but this fight just rates to be kind of like a striking battle. You know, like if Nicolau gets his gets what he wants, which is kind of a boring, striking-based, technical win, I mean, he's not going to come anywhere near the optimal. So I think that you could probably, I don't want to say X him out, but certainly not prioritize him. I mean, if anything, it would be Perez. So think about this. Like, So if you can cross off or not prioritize, I guess, or not using your main lineups, the, the, the main event favorite, who's going to get a lot of ownership. And if you can throw out that theoretical lock, the 8,200, there are lots of options for you to play. Okay. Anybody from the span fight, anybody from the Pierce fight, anybody from the Silva fight, right? Uh, and even this Medich fight. So what, what this is kind of looking looking like, you really want to really want to call it what it is, is these earlier fights, you're probably going to play like me. You're probably going to be anti-sweater. I mean, you're probably going to be rooting for some boring stuff. I mean, the only fight which I'm really going to want violence in probably is going to be this Petrovich fight. I'm probably going to be, at the end of the day, probably ending up fading Mashate, rooting against this fight. Rooting, I'll end up probably rooting for somebody here. I'll probably end up fading the Elan top thing. It's just too many other ways to win. I'll probably fade the Sousa fight completely, probably fade Machado completely, probably fade Big Lock, Big Lock completely, probably fade Henry completely, and then slowly but surely ramp up into these freaking fights where you want to play both sides and you'll have a whole bunch of combinations to, to roll with. And that's kind of fun. Um, we're going to be doing a uh, betting breakdown. Hopefully, we're going to be doing a line of construction video, hopefully. But if I did not get to any of that, I apologize, and hopefully this will at least give you some, some headway, uh, some framework of what you're supposed to do this week. Uh, good luck, everybody.